Good evening, everybody. And I suppose everybody's introduced themselves. Uh, my name is Elaine Levy, and I'm working as an organic specialist with Chagas for oh, a decade and a half now, 15 years. And I travel down from County Offaly, so there's nobody has any grudge, hopefully, against me in the crowd tonight, being from Offaly, from the bogs of Offaly. Uh, I suppose just before I start, um, in relation to organic and organic farming, and where it's all the drive is coming from. As I said, I'm working in organics for about 15 years at this stage. And in the last 15 months to two years, there has been a great momentum and policy driving organic production right across Europe. Frank mentioned in the introduction in relation to our climate action plan and our food vision plan in Ireland as regards the targets for organic farming. And maybe just to go through where that is coming from, Right across Europe, you will have heard about EU Green Deal, you would have heard about the Farm to Fork strategy, and the ambition is to drive organic production in Europe to 25% by the year 2030. And if you think about that, that's one field in four. Here in Ireland, as Frank said, the, the area is, is, is small. If I was standing, standing in front of you uh, this time last year, where I have that figure at 4%, there was only 2% of the, of the land being farmed organically. And I'll talk a little bit about later, about numbers, etc. So presently in Ireland, we have 4% uh, being farmed organically. And as Frank outlined, the target is to reach, the present government target is to bring that to 10% in, in, by 2030. In Europe at the moment, right across Europe, the average is at 9.1%. And again, all indications is that that is to continue to grow. Just to kind of drill it down to where are the organic farmers? And the first thing you can see here, I'm showing you, Cork is in the leaderboard, number one in the leaderboard. I have listed here all the organic farms that are farming organically as of January 2023. Right across Ireland, there is over 4,000 farmers in this category. If we are to break it down, in conversion, there's just over 2,000. So 2,000 farms have started conversion since the 1st of January. Prior to this, we had just over 2,000 that had converted. So we have 4,000. 50% of the farms are located in seven counties. And if you actually look at the counties we have here, oh gosh, I've turned it off. No, I haven't. If we look at the counties that are outlined here, you can see a lot of counties are where there are hill sheep. So there's a lot of hill, sheepers, hill sheep farmers farming organically. So it is definitely an option. And we will go through the practical implications of that. So that's to give you an outline of where they're located. Just in relation to organic farming, when a farmer decides to convert their farm to organics, what happens? How long does it take? Um, the land, the farm undergoes what's called a conversion. So in the first two years, a farm is under conversion. So all farmers starting January 23, they're in conversion for two years. And then their farm is, receives what's called full organic status in two years' time. So in the 1st of January 2025. Sometimes I say that that's nearly the easy part in relation to converting the farm. You need to know the challenges and the practicalities that you have to make to farm organically. Just to give an overview, uh, the word organic farming regulation, I suppose just I want to give you an idea. All of you, you've just talked about, uh, Patricia there talked about acres and the acre scheme. And you, you're in a number of schemes and usually when you decide to go into a scheme, you go to your advisor and your advisor assists you and you make your application of the scheme. I suppose in organics, there's a, another ring in the lather. It's a little bit more, um, more steps. So just maybe to give you a very quick overview. In Europe, we have organic regulations. So there's a legislation in place that all organic farmers in Europe adhere to. Looking at here in Ireland, the competent authority, the authority that ensures that all organic farmers, producers and processes adhere to that is the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And they have a specialised organic unit based in Johnstown Castle in Wexford. What, what they do then is they have designated the role of the inspection of all organic farmers to an organic certification body 
of which there are two in Ireland, the Irish Organic Association and Organic Trust. So before you decide to convert to organics or before you apply to join an organic farming scheme, the first step that you have to make is you have to apply to the organic certification body. Because for the duration of, let's say, the organic five-year scheme, you will be inspected on an annual basis by the organic certification bodies. And they've been designated and given that role by the Department of Agriculture. Here is what organic farming scheme, we were just listened to Patricia in relation to the acre scheme. This is the organic farming scheme. And like what Patricia said, in relation to those 2,000 people that have applied for the organic farming scheme, they have, will know in the next number of weeks as regards their acceptance into the scheme. So what are you joining up to? So this is very quickly, I'm going to go to, as I said, it's an area-based scheme. So we'll just go to a dry stock farmer, and I've just given the example of a 40 hectare sheep farm there on the right. As I mentioned to you that when your farm undergoes, uh, enters organics, it undergoes this two-year conversion. So while your farm is undergoing uh, this two-year conversion, you receive, you receive the payment of 300 euros per hectare in year one and two. And then from year three, four, and five, this is reduced to 250 euros per hectare. So that's the area-based payment. For the first time ever, there is actually what's called a participation payment. And in year one, this is 2,000 euros. And from year two, right up to the end of to year five, this is 1,400 euros per annum. So that's a top up on the, on the scheme. I mentioned that you have to register with organic certification body. They charge you a fee every year for the inspection and licensing. So this can be put forward to that. So that is the payment. So again, maybe just to mention the high rate, I've just mentioned up to 70 hectares, but beyond 70 hectares, you're still eligible for payment. You're eligible after the 70 hectares, 60 euro per hectare in year one and two, and 30 euros per hectare. So again, that's the payment rates there. Just a little bit, just to, to, to mention as regards the actual payment, as I've said, it's an area-based payment. It is only uh, on owned or leased land is eligible. So short-term or con-acre land is not eligible. So for people that went in in January uh, for five years and they had leased land, they would have to have the leased land for the full duration of the scheme. Commonage there is not eligible for payment under organics. In relation to the stocking rate, there is a minimum stocking rate that you have to carry to get your area-based payment. Again, this has been changed from previous schemes, and it is down at the moment, the new scheme, it's, minus, it's 0.1 livestock unit per hectare, which is equivalent to a yaw per hectare, is the minimum stocking rate, and I state it's the minimum stocking rate. Again, it depends on what part of the country you're in as regards your what your land can carry. There will be, the, of the 2,000, the 4,000 farmers that are farming organically, there's a huge range of stocking rate. I would have people that would be having just the 0.1 livestock unit, but I would have people that have 1.5, 1.6. So within that range, there is a huge range as regards the stocking rate. It's whatever can suit the system, and, and Damien will be talking about that in a few minutes. And now I'm going to hand you over to Damien, and Damien's going to take a look at the practical implications in relation to conversion. Over to you, Damien. Okay, uh, thanks, Elaine, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as Elaine said, I'm just going to take up the story uh, from where she left off, um, looking at the practical implications uh, for people. Uh, somebody already pointed out uh, a lot of the hill farmers have, 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 have moved over are in conversion to organics. Some of you may be considering it. So these are, I suppose, an outline of uh, the key changes we see at farm level um, in the conversion over to organics. And those are the, the broad um, areas I'm, I'm going to cover it under. So in terms of uh, the suitability of a hill sheep farm for organic farm, it's very farm specific. It's not going to suit every farm. 
and at least as Patricia mentioned earlier, um, how your, your, it will uh, interact with your, your acres payment. Um, as I see it, Elaine mentioned it earlier, the change in the minimum stocking rate for the organic farming scheme in 2023, uh, moving it back down to, uh, to 0 0.1 or the, the equivalent of one euro per hectare, uh, that has, been, has, has created a big shift uh, towards the organic. Um, in terms of the change over from conventional to organic, um, you know, hill grazing management will remain largely the same. There should be no big change there. Uh, again, uh, as Elaine mentioned, uh, there's no payment on commonage. Uh, if you're in a farm situation that has a good bit of enclosed hill ground, uh, a substantial area of it, maybe th those are the people that are, have been more tempted uh, towards a move to organics uh, versus somebody who has a predominantly commonage farm. And again, uh, I suppose the extent of, of semi-improved uh, grassland uh, that, that's on the farm will determine a lot in terms of the systems uh, that will suit an, in a, an organic farming system. Um, we have uh, hill farmers participating in the, in the Chagas Better Farm program uh, because they have a substantial area of semi-improved ground along with their hill ground. They're successfully able to run uh, a crossbred flock alongside the, their hill flock. And as we see it, that's probably possible in an organic scenario, albeit maybe at a, a, slightly, less, a slightly lower stocking rate. Um, just to, to look at a couple of the key aspects, I suppose, um, to, to consider um, in terms of the, 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 the farming system. If we look first at, at, breeding, at breeding policy, uh, in our opinion, the gold standard is breeding uh, replacements from within your own flock. In other words, uh, a closed flock, um, you're using your own, your, your existing helio flock to, to breed replacements. It presents lots of more opportunities in terms of breed improvement. Uh, and the other big advantage is that from a, a flock health point of view, it avoids uh, buying in uh, some of the nasties that, uh, that um, Jason spoke about earlier on. However, it is possible under derogation uh, that you can purchase up to 20% uh, replacement uh, stock from a non-organic source. But again, you must get, you must get uh, approval for, or a, a derogation from the, the organic certifying body. Again, as I, as I mentioned previously, if, if you have the farm type or the land type uh, to allow you to consider crossbreeding, uh, this is a bit of work uh, carried out by Karen Lynch a number of years ago um, in relation to uh, an example, I suppose, of uh, the proportion of, flock, of the flock you need to pure breed versus the amount you can potentially crossbreed. And we can see here in the, the left-hand column, it's very dependent on the, the current flock productivity. Uh, so in terms of lambs reared per year joined, uh, you have, we have the different, uh, uh, different range of figures along here. Um, if we take the, the kind of, the, the person that's weaning uh, about a lamb to, to 1.05 lambs, um, in that particular situation, they can potentially uh, pure breed just 50% uh, of their flock to a hill breed of ram um, and generate enough uh, replacements uh, for the hill flock. And then they have the option of crossbreeding um, the, the other 50%. Uh, so it's, as I said, that won't apply on every farm, but um, if, if your farm uh, has the potential to, to, to do that, uh, by all means. In terms of the rams, uh, again, uh, there, there's great flexibility here in that non-organic non rams uh, can be purchased uh, as replacements. Um, again, if you're, if you're in a situation where you're, you're, you're crossbreeding, I'm not saying that everybody should be crossbreeding or anything, but you have a great pick of performance recorded rams uh, to choose from. And if you're looking to finish lambs on your farm uh, and you choose uh, um, crossbred rams or, or lowland rams uh, that are high genetic, genetic merit on the terminal index, um, You'll, ha you'll have the ability to get those lambs uh, to slaughter that bit quicker. Equally, uh, some people will be uh, crossbreeding with a maternal sire uh, in order to produce lowland replacements. Uh, and again, go going on to the pure breeding in terms of selecting hill breeds, we'll hear a little bit more in the next paper from Kevin uh, about uh, the, the purchase, uh, purchasing a sire verified, verified ram in terms of complying with the sheep improvement scheme. And hopefully, as advances are made in terms of performance recording, that there will be more um, performance recorded hill rams available in the future. So again, in terms of grazing management, um, 
as with all hill sheep systems, really important that you, you optimize the use of hill grazing that's available on your farm. Um, we mentioned earlier on that commonage is not eligible for payment uh, under the scheme. It is uh, perfectly allowable to graze your sheep on the commonage. Uh, the one major condition there is that they're properly hefted um, in an effort that they are, you know, they're kept in their own group uh, and they're not uh, mixing with, with non-organic sheep as far as possible. So, as I said, the, the management of the hill grazing uh, doesn't really change. Uh, it's just a matter of having an appropriate stocking rate so that you're not overgrazing or undergrazing uh, the, the hill environment that you're dealing with. Um, again, in terms of the enclosed green ground or the improved grassland, um, there are steps you can take. The obvious big change uh, in that is that you're not allowed any chemical fertilizer uh, under the organic system, uh, to, to state the obvious. But uh, that's not to say that if you, t if you uh, the first step probably is to take soil samples and have soil samples for the area. Um, you can apply lime, provided the, the ground is, is suitable to travel and safe to travel. Um, if you have farmyard manure and slurry available on the farm, uh, this can be targeted at the lower P and K indices uh, based again on your soil samples. And there is uh, the option, again, if it's available in your area, uh, to uh, import farmyard manure or slurry from uh, non-organic farms. Um, is clover an option? I suppose it very much depends, again, on the, on, on the type of green ground and the quality of green ground that you, you have available to you. Uh, but where it is, there's massive potential uh, has been shown in several studies uh, of the ability of clover to fix nitrogen naturally from the atmosphere. Uh, there have been studies conducted where uh, between 150 and 250 kilograms per hectare was being fixed in a situation where you had a grass clover sward with about 20% clover in the mix. Um, so again, and, and the highest gains uh, were achieved there on the lowest level of chemical nitrogen. So obviously there's zero chemical nitrogen allowed in the organic system. So massive potential there, provided that the land is suitable to, to establish clover either in a reseed or in a, in a stitch-in situation. Again, it's important in, in managing this green ground, uh, a little bit of fencing infrastructure is, is really helpful uh, in terms of being able to, to close up pieces and, and rotationally graze. Um, and somebody mentioned earlier on the, the non-chemical con uh, weed control. Um, you're, you're limited, uh, obviously, that you, you cannot use chemicals in terms of weed control. So again, relying on, on methods such as topping or mulching, uh, and also um, that you, you need to um, your grassland management, I suppose, avoiding poaching, things like that. Everything you can do to make the grass more, more competitive with the unde undesirable weed species. Um, the, the person that raised the issue on the, on the, the noxious weeds, again, is possibly something that, that, that needs, to be, needs to be looked at um, from that point of view. Uh, again, uh, from a flock nutrition point of view, um, we're, we're mainly talking about graze forage. 100% of the... Of the uh, of the, the animal's diet must come from uh, an organic sources. Um, so as I say, mainly graze forage, but there are times of the year when concentrate supplementation will be required, um, namely late pregnancy for the yews and, and possibly for finishing lambs if that's part of your plan. Uh, the big drawback gets very, very expensive. The prices we're hearing this year ranging from 850 to 950 euro per tonne uh, in 2023. Uh, just something to note, uh, given that uh, lambing is only around the corner for a lot of farmers, um, there is no organic uh, artificial uh, milk replacer available or, or the colostrum substitute that lots of people would have used in a conventional system. Um, the next best thing, I suppose, or the, the first option is to uh, collect uh, some colostrum or, or milk from, from earlier lambing yews that have a, a, an ample supplier that have excess. Uh, the second protocol is looking maybe to cross foster onto another yew. Um, in a situation where, there, where, there, where neither of these options are possible, you are permitted to feed the conventional uh, colostrum substitute or milk replacer substitute. The one proviso is that you must uh, tag the animal uh, to identify them that, uh, and, and it ensure afterwards that they're not sold into the organic market. Uh, Again, staying with the lambs for post weaning, 60% uh, um, of, the, uh, of the, the daily dry matter intake must come in the, in the form of forage. So maybe uh, the intensive indoor finishing system uh, that we would have looked at in Athenry on the, on the conventional system 
it may not be, uh, it, it is not an option really for the, the organic farmer. Um, again, uh, from the hill sheep system, um, outwintering is probably the, 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 the overwintering system of choice with most people. Uh, and again, that's fine from an organic point of view. Uh, just make sure that you're in compliance with the, the cross compliance rules. Uh, there are some hill sheep farmers that have housing available to them and they house some or all of their, their flock for a period over the winter. Uh, the one thing to bear in mind um, is that from the table here, on the, sorry, I'm going, uh, just from this table here, uh, the space requirement uh, for organic sheep housing uh, is higher than the, the, the standard. So it's one and a half meters squared per head for adult shows. It's 0.35 meters squared uh, per head per lamb. Um, at least 50% of the area must be a, a solid floor with, with straw bedding. So if you take the conventional slatted uh, housing for sheep, uh, there needs to be an equivalent area of, uh, of lieback uh, with a straw bedded area. Um, again, from the point of view of sourcing straw, it can come from a, a non-organic source. Um, yeah, nearly there. Sorry, Grania. Uh, the flock health plan, uh, again, really important part of the thing. It's drawn up in consultation with your veterinary surgeon. Uh, the important thing is to take account of the farm history in drawing up the, this. And the overall aim is that you reduce uh, to a minimum the, the veterinary interventions of the veterinary treatments. Uh, however, that said, uh, the, the, the health and welfare of the animal is, is always front and center in, as part of the, the organic ethos. So um, if, if animals require treatment, uh, they, they, they are treated, again, with the approval of your veterinary surgeon. Uh, the one uh, proviso there is that at least double the withdrawal period is required, so it's double what's indicated on the manufacturer's label. And the meat processors, um, some of them have, have customers that have, have, have even higher standards that require triple the withdrawal period, so that's fairly substantial for some of the, the treatments. Just to give you a quick idea of the type of issues uh, that, that, uh, in terms of a hill flock health plan, uh, from the point of view of stomach worms, um, you know, we'll be looking at co-grazing with cattle in order to lower the parasite burden, continuously monitoring uh, the faecal egg counts um, in terms of, um, you know, if, if the faecal egg counts um, reaches the level uh, that require treatment, um, your, your vet will sign off on your treatment. Um, again, from the point of view, somebody mentioned earlier on, the point of view of treating external parasites, uh, looking at things like um, you know, removal, uh, soil, wool, and so on, in order to prevent blowfly strike. You can use uh, porons uh, for prevention uh, and treatment, but you can't use, as somebody mentioned earlier, you can't use the, the organophosphate tips. Um, in terms of uh, lameness, uh, we can use uh, zinc or, or, or copper sulfate in a footpath. Um, uh, antibiotics would traditionally be, uh, sheep farmers would traditionally be fairly low users of antibiotics, but treating lameness or uh, tr treating clinical lameness cases would be one of the main reasons that antibiotics would be used on a sheep farm. So, preventative foot bathing. Uh, again, uh, liver flu can be a, an issue on, on hill sheep farms. Uh, again, using the farm history and also the gold standard, I suppose, would be seeking out liver reports from the abattoirs uh, to see what your status is like. Again, where farm history indicates uh, vaccines are uh, allowable, but um, again, based on farm history, and as we mentioned, avoid buying in problems by, by closing your flock. Uh, this is the very last one. Um, again, in terms of marketing our organic lamb, uh, there's one main processor looking after organic lamb at the minute. If you're in a situation uh, where you're going to be finishing organic lamb or you're, you're in conversion, um, it's important to make contact with the supplier make contact with other farmers that are supplying uh, this just to, to, to establish uh, the, the, the market. Uh, generally speaking, there's about 15% of a premium above the, the conventional price. Um, lots of hill farmers will, will ask the, the question, I'm not able to finish lambs on my farm, or I'm not in a posi position to finish lambs. You can sell stores. Uh, ideally, you'd be looking at maybe linking up with another organic finisher, uh, but they can be sold into the conventional market. Uh, these are just uh, the, the couple of take-home messages, I suppose, as Elaine outlined earlier on, uh, the, the, the Department of Agriculture and Food are uh, supporting the conversion to organics with the, the, the organic farming scheme. Um, very important uh, to, br to breed suitable replacements and to cull any uh, non-poor uh, performers that are not performing in the organic system. 
Um, again, as always, optimizing the utilization of your hill grazing. Um, maintain the productivity of the, the improved grassland and knock as much as you can out of that. And again, the importance of um, uh, putting a good bit of work with your veterinary surgeon into your initial flock health plan. So thank you very much. Thanks, Damon and Elaine. Elaine, you might come back up there yeah, for any questions. So, um, again, rubber microphones going around the, the audience there. And so, um, just Damon, I suppose, Clover, you know, I suppose look, we see big in costs in terms of fertilizers and whatnot and reduced margins. Like, you know, I suppose, top tip in getting maybe top one or two tips in getting Clover onto to farms. Yeah, again, as I said, you, you have the option of going for a full reseed. Um, the couple of key things, I suppose, is having soil fertility uh, right, having your lime. Uh, up around 6.5. And um, if the sward is very old and very dense, it's probably difficult. It's challenging to 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 um, to, to, to to introduce it. So you maybe are looking at, a, at something that or some sort of cult cultivation that at least causes some ground disturbance. And I think the 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 management of it after sowing is is, is important as the as the sowing of it itself. Um, in terms of not waiting too long to graze it, not letting the grass take it over, and having the fence and infrastructure there in place that it's possible to get in quickly and graze it and allow it to regrow. So those are some of the, the main ones, I think, right? Really. Super, thanks, Simon. We have a microphone down here. At the back, is it? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, concerning the, the organic, um, most upland places, our farms are... Uh, both suckler and sheep, a lot of them. And uh, I'm just wondering, this is very driven by the amount of funding that's allocated towards it. But after that, the market is a, a huge concern to me. If it goes from 2 to 4 to 10%, is there a market out there? You know, I have some doubts because I've seen organic animals, particularly stores, Wainlings and store lambs going through the marketplace and identified as organic, they didn't make a whole lot more and sometimes less because, they'd, first of all, they'd be a lesser weight. So I'd be a bit concerned of the amount of people moving on from the market point of view. Is there a market out there? I wonder. Yeah, Thank it, you. The, it, Real question. I just see you said it's gone from 4% to 10%. Um, no. That's a 75% increase in... No, in no, Wait, no, no, sorry, no, yeah. sorry. Maybe, maybe you misheard me, no. Within Ireland, is a... It, yeah, it's a, it's a proposal that it'll go from 4% yeah, to 10%. Government, the, and that's what I'm asking, in much similar to Neely. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, is there a market out there? And from your experience, being an organic for 15 years, is there much of an increase in the price between the convention animal and the organic animal? And we only have one avatar, I believe, in all. Is there going to be a market for this big increase in organic feed coming into the market? Certainly, yes. I have to agree with you. It certainly is a challenge. And the figures that you're quoting, that the targets are there. To answer it, there is in place, from a policy point of view, an organic forum. And that is made up of all members, stakeholders involved in organics, from advisors to processors to the department and Borbia, et cetera, are all involved in that. And th certainly that is one of the main actions of that, is to get markets for this increased production. And they would be saying that, that we have, they, they would be saying that there's a two-year conversion to work on that, but it has to be worked on, and I, I fully agree with that. And the plan would be that those involved in marketing, that, all, that along with the production, that the markets will be worked on and got. That is the plan. Okay. Another in relation question. to the premium price, sorry, in relation to the premium price, in as regards um, as regards the premium price, as what the premium price has always been about 45 cent or 15 cent. 15% above what conventional lamb price, and that has been more or less what has been all along the way. In relation to the, the cattle, the beef price, uh, you're talking about 15, 20% has always been the differential. Certainly, yes, with everything that has happened in the last couple of years, where cattle, pri where the beef prices conventionally ro ro rose, so did the, so did the, the organic price, but at some stages it wouldn't have been quite the 15%. So I, 
So certainly, yes, work has to be done, but with the forum there, the, the plan is that work will be put in place to get these markets. Okay, we have another question here. Um, yeah, Damien, there on the price of the organic feed and stuff. This year, Kerry, we're paying up to 1,200 euros for a ton of feed. And at the moment, we can't get the feed. There's not enough stock in the country, we've been told. Um, even merchants, merchants are struggling to get the organic feed. Yeah. So, and this year coming, is there any way we could put safeguards in place that there would be enough feed um, for next winter? Thanks. Yeah, no, but it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a challenge, John Joe, yeah. And um, uh, the, the, some of the, I, again, I'm just basing my prices on what we'd have heard. And, um, you know, there was one... The, I one presume that local. is by bag, is it? You're buying it by bags, yes. It is, would be more expensive by bag, yes, certainly. Yeah. Uh, there are rations, and I know there, as you said, there's rations being got... Um, I think, just not name checking, but in this area, Irish Organic Feeds and Kinsale have a number of rations available, and I think they have a uh, ration available in around 890, but that would be buying by bulk. And there would be a number of other uh, compounders, uh, Morins, uh, Kiernan's, for example, that would be doing, uh, doing bags, and I'd say that's something what you're buying. Yeah, there is, there is a, s a number of, I suppose, uh, people uh, growing what's called combination crops, which is a cereal and pea crop, and there is a number of those. There's a gentleman in Wexford, there's up in Port Leash, there's a number, three or four of those dotted around that are doing the combination crops. And yes, I know by talking to them that with a double the amount going in, there is an increased demand for it, certainly, and it is... It is in short supply, but it is, is available, but at that very high price that you're paying, yes. And I suppose it is something maybe that, just to follow on, like what Damien was saying, in relation to what are the alternatives, look at, I suppose, not harping back on it, but grassland management is going to be key, uh, looking at trying to maximise as much from grass. And if you have that green land, be looking at something like clover to give you that good quality good quality silage albeit yes and we we're talking myself and michael were, and damien were talking about it earlier you are going to need a certain level of feed like we talk about maybe an organic soy coming in at like on its own there's an organic soy ration coming 19 percent ration with 20 percent soy coming in at 890 euros so you're going to have to budget for something like that to get your you ready pre-lambing we'll take two more from the floor um so down the left area. Uh, thank you, Dan McCarthy, manager at Kinmayer Mart. Uh, I've uh, listened attentively to what you've said uh, about the marketing and everything else. There'd be no mention of a livestock mart, of what, what the mart can do to, to market this land. We know in the, the, the part of the country we're talking, West Cork and South Kerry, that most, at least 70 or 80 percent of the land is sold through the mats and moved up the country for further feeding. Is it a case now that, the, that there will be feed for the farmers that have only a limited amount of green ground and they have to shift the lamb off the land to move them on up the country? Like, I honestly believe that the mats have a part to play in this, even though it hasn't been mentioned here tonight. It, it is a, a part of it and uh, that you should be inclined to push that the mats will run organic sales for the, for the people yeah. to buy the sheep or the cattle and to help because the livestock mats have been a part of this country for a long number of years and they've set a, a trend of the market of, of every animal and you'll get a fair price whether it's good or bad to the market price of the day and I have grave concerns of trying to push it from farm to fork and levy out the mats. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, I'd agree with you. I'd agree with you, Dan, as well. Uh, you know, if the, if the demand is there for 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 such sales, um, you know, they certainly would be would be welcomed. And as I mentioned in the in the in the latter slide, there, uh, you know, ideally, if we can get this organic lamb, uh, to, if it's not possible to finish it on the, the farm of origin, if we can get it to an organic finisher, and certainly, uh, special organic sales for for uh, for organic lamb would would be welcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, and there actually is, just to take on your point as well, there actually is additional marts coming and starting to, to sell animals. For example, tomorrow in, in Temple Moor, there's actually an organic cattle sales. Uh, you have uh, Kilmalloch is coming up as well, I think, at the end of March. Drumshambo, I know it's a long way up to Leitrim, to North Leitrim, but Drumshambo has, has nearly 10 or 11. So certainly I agree with you. And there's nothing stopping a mart coming together and working, you know, and Absolutely. from our sales point of view, we've got six new regional full-time organic advisors in place. So they're there to help and to facilitate all of this. So certainly there is opportunities for Marts and for us all to work together to, to develop that. So that would be a positive, definitely. And I agree with what, what Damien said in relation to bringing animals. And the ideal would be if we could get match people that have the lamb here and bring it up to the to to uh, to be finished where they are. So that would be the ideal, definitely. Yes. We we'll take our last question from the floor. Um, thank you. Um, could you, if you had a mixed enterprise on your farm, could you split it and run half of the enterprise in organic and run the other half as a con conventional? Yes, uh, per, yeah, per, par, what you're talking about there is partial conversion that you you uh, convert part of your farm. Yes, that is is permitted, but the proviso is that let's say you have a cattle and sheep enterprise, you can have the cattle enterprise can be organic and the sheep cannot be organic. So it has to be different species of animals. So if it's mixed in cattle and sheep, it can, but you again have to keep everything separate and financial records and all the rest has to be separate for both. So the short answer is yes, partial conversion is permitted. Uh, would you have to get a different herd number for to work it out? Then no, or no, 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 you would not, no. And we'll say at the springtime and at, last the, question, no. the, last, <laughs> at the end of the year for the topping, how would you manage it? Maybe, as it is at the moment, you might be bringing the sheep down near the house for lambing into some of the better fields, and maybe the same at the end of the year for topping. How is that going to work? Well, you have to, if you're going to do something that you literally get a red marker and you mark around your organic part and your non-organic part, and they must stay separate. That's, not being, that's, the, that's the, the ruling on that. Okay. So look, um, thanks um, to Damien and Elaine for coming out. Okay.